All right, what's up, guys? We are back with another episode, and uh, I, you know, I am I am continuing to enjoy this study. Uh, I'm also enjoying this study that we're, we we started last week on Wednesday. So if you're not part of of that, uh, we are broadcasting and recording on Facebook and YouTube. On Wednesday nights now, we we weren't doing that for a while, but now we've kind of built up the AV team. Uh, shout out to uh, to all the AV volunteers that are that are helping out with that. But um, we're going through the Book of Acts, and we're going to be uh, discussing uh, kind of chapter by chapter, walking through, looking at the 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 early church. And unfortunately, a lot of churches don't do this. I, I think there's lots of reasons. I actually had somebody last Wednesday come up and ask me a specific question like why don't why don't churches do this that and the other and I said um you know I, I can't speak for everybody that does or does not do certain things especially when they're right there in the Bible but I can make a couple of educated guesses uh, money power slash control fear and ignorance uh, those are all very uh, massively motivating factors and I think that's one of the reasons why people avoid the book of Acts. They're, they're either ignorant of what's in there or they're told it's just a history book. Avoid it. Let's just skip right over the Gospels or, or go through the Gospels and skip right over Acts. Jump right into Romans where the real meat is. Uh, or they are um, they're fearful. Fearful of the, the blowback from uh, either the congregation or fearful of their denominational structure. Because once you get just a couple of chapters into the book of Acts, many of the things that people teach, uh, even a 12 or 13 or 14 year old can just pick up the, the book of Acts and read and go, wait a minute, this is completely counter to what we believe or what we teach or what we say is true. What is going on here? And I think they a lot of people just want to avoid some of those tough conversations and um, might even be afraid of uh, people looking over their shoulder and possibly yanking their uh, their career out from under them or their pastorship or whatever it might be. Then, of course, you get into the, 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 the control, the power, the money. This is also sort of a fear thing, but it's more, I'd say, more nefarious. It's more like they're just afraid of losing power. They're afraid of losing a congregation because then they'll, you know, maybe have to downsize. Uh, they're afraid of losing a lot of that tithe and offering. And again, none of these are good, uh, but they are they are real. And so if you're in that boat, but you're hungry for God and you want you need some of that like umph, come on, jump in, be anonymous, jump on Facebook Live <laughs> or watch the recording, and we'll go through the book of Acts. And if you have questions, uh, always you can reach out to us on like Facebook Messenger. We try to be pretty proactive about um, um answering uh, legitimate questions and things like that there. And then also uh, contact at, uh, at breadbreakers.com. Contact at breadbreakers.com. You can always email us and ask questions there. So we've been going through the uh, book of Genesis on the podcast and uh, uh, at least the first few chapters. I don't know if we'll go through the entire book or if we'll just kind of hit the... Um, the the initial creation and beginnings and then and then move on from there we'll just see how how God leads but right now we are in uh, in chapter three <clears throat> and this is where we start getting into uh, the fall so let's let's start with Genesis chapter three and verse one it says now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. So just a couple things here. You've got the serpent, and you and, you, and there's that obvious uh, connection between the serpent and and Satan, right? The dragon, the serpent, uh, deceiving the enti the entire world, right? But here, the serpent comes and uh, says to Eve, 
hey, are you sure this is what God said? Did he really say this to you? Now, Eve was there in the middle of the garden. Uh, it seems that her husband was there with her, because later on we'll see, and we may not get to it right here in this uh, in this section or on this on this episode, but it says, you know, she took the, the fruit and she, she gave to her husband who was with her. I mean, the indication seems to be he was right there with her. Uh, but the... Some people will ask, like, well, you know, did did animals talk? Well, it seems like the serpent did, at least, uh, because we have uh, Eve not really being like, oh, my goodness, what's going on? This crazy serpent is is talking to me. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, kind of a kind of a crazy, crazy deal if that wasn't something you were used to. Um, but maybe not, maybe, maybe she was just new and bright eyed, bushy tailed and didn't know that this isn't normal. Um, Bible doesn't really get into a whole lot of that, but the serpent spoke to her and, uh, it seems to indicate that, right, more crafty than any other beast of the field. So here we have this serpent trying to beguile or deceive Eve and, it's uh it's interesting to me that the serpent goes right after questioning the word of God. Now when I say that I don't mean bringing le- legitimate questions. We you know a lot of people talk about Berean uh Berean faith, Ber- you know uh, Berean Christians and how they they had legitimate questions and didn't just believe everything that was that was coming at them but they went and studied the scriptures and brought their you know, brought their questions and stuff. So, so when I say question, that's not saying it's wrong to, you know, never question the man of God or never question what you're told or anything like that. We should, but those questions should be coming from a place of, I want to know the truth. I want to learn. I want to grow. What Satan is doing here is he is trying to get Eve to doubt what God has clearly said. And that's the difference. It's not a matter of like, well, did God actually say this? Let's go study and look and see. Or, uh, well, is that that's what somebody said that verse means? But let me go study that out and see if that's really what it is. Maybe, maybe go back to him and ask him, you know, a few questions to for clarification. That's not what's going on here. Satan is coming to Eve and trying to get her to doubt what God has clearly said. And of course, Eve's response is that, you know, yeah, God said we we can't eat of the fruit. Now, it's interesting here, and I, I think there's some debate or whatnot uh, as to why she said this, but remember, God said don't eat of the fruit because you're going to die if you do. She says um, you can't eat it and you can't touch it lest you die. I don't know where that came from. I do know that adding to or taking away from the Word of God is a problem. You can go to, uh, I believe it's where Moses is giving the, uh, uh, you know, the, the the two mountain kind of sermon, the approach. Uh, you know, here's the mountain of uh, blessings, the mountain of curses in Deuteronomy, and you know, he, he I think it's there that he says, you know, you don't add to or take away from from these words. And um, in the book of Revelation, same thing, talks about don't adding, not adding to or taking away from the words of this prophecy. So it, it's, very, uh, it's very problematic when we start to add to the Word of God or take away from the Word of God, uh, as though that was, that was what God said. So God says, uh, thou shalt not eat of the fruit of the tree to add to that oh, and God said, don't touch it, lest you die, that's a problem. It's a problem because if you go to the point of touching it and you don't die, which God never said you would die if you touch it, he said you would die if you eat it. But if, let's just say a man, uh, a leader, some organization, right, comes up with a rule, don't touch it either, but God never really said don't touch it. And then we conflate, confuse, or commingle 
what God has said with what man has said, and and now we're trying to make it like God said both of these. Well, if somebody does go ahead and touch the fruit and they don't die, well, now they might question the legitimate word of God. Wait a minute. I touched it and I didn't die. Well, maybe if I eat it, I'll be fine. But God only said, don't eat it. Otherwise, you will die when you eat it. And I think that's, again, a, a, a good teaching point for uh, putting guidelines, parameters, you know, rules, things like that in a, in a family. Uh, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't make things as though God said them if he didn't. Just, just say, hey, this is a family rule. God has given us uh, parental authority and oversight and, and, and government in the home, and we believe this is a good rule for our home. But don't try to make it like, well, here, you know, pull some scripture out of context, and oh, well, this is, you know, this is actually a, a, a Bible thing for all people everywhere, a doctrine that we should be, we should be teaching. Same thing in a church. A lot of times, people will have personal convictions. Let's say a pastor or a leader or whatever. And it might even be a good, it might even be a good conviction. It might be something good that other people would do well to follow. But then they might teach that as though it's a, a doctrine that God has said this. And now we're adding to the word of God and we get into trouble with stuff like that. One, we're kind of putting ourselves in the place of God. But we can also run into problems where people might break our you know, arbitrary rule or man-made rule or even a good rule, but it's man-made, uh, and then feel like, well, I've I've just completely let God down, so I might as well just break whatever law because I've broken this one that, that that's God's law or God's rule. So we just, again, need to be careful, and we have a picture of that here. Uh, if, if Adam was the one that communicated this to Eve, uh, maybe he shouldn't have done that, and then she'd be afraid. I, I don't really have a test case before I actually eat it. I right? In this case, she can touch it, nothing happens. Oh, I guess it's okay to eat. If they had left it at eat it, maybe she wouldn't have done it. I don't know. Uh probably she still would have, but but who knows? Uh in any case, we shouldn't add to or take away from the the word of God. We shouldn't try to explain away things either. We shouldn't try to remove uh uh teachings of the word of God. Oh, well, that's not for today. Uh, you know, oh, that's not that's not what that really means. This is what it really means. Nobody knew this till I showed up on the scene, but here's what it really means, right? That kind of stuff. So, um, let's go on to verse 4. It says, "But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil." Now, this is literally the the original, this is OG temptation. <laughs> this is the, the, the original sin, the original temptation, pride. And specifically, the desire to be like God or to, to be gods, right? And this is this is just it's all over different religions. Um the the, uh, the 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 new age sort of Eastern mysticism kind of thing is very um, very big on like you're you're kind of your own deal you know your own again some go as far as to say you're your own god others may just kind of make it that way but not overtly say it um, I've seen quote unquote right <laughs> little C uh, Christians Christian organizations uh, Christian uh, denominations or leaders like kind of creeping into this thing where we're like little g gods uh other other again other religions and stuff clearly um and and of course people in the people in the world in the secular sphere use this this phrase a lot you know now it's it's ai right now it's ai and ai is the god or we are the gods that have created ai or or, or whatever it's literally the oldest, just so old and recycled and re-recycled over and over again, but it works. I think that, <laughs> I think, 
I think that's the thing. It it works. It works on people to play to their pride, <coughs> to to play to that desire to be in control, to be the 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 end all and be all. Uh, I'm in control of my own destiny. Um, it works, and so. I think a lot of times what happens is uh, Satan just goes back and says, if, 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 it ain't, if it ain't broke, why fix it, right? And so I think this is a very good opportunity for us to, to, to check ourselves. Are, are we, do we find it difficult to submit to the Word of God, to realize our place in the created order, God, Christ, man, woman, uh, do we find it difficult to submit to God? The Bible says to submit yourselves to God, right? Peter said, submit yourselves to God. Uh, it's not a, it's not a, you know, just readily always easy thing, but I, I think we need to get to the point to where it's, it's easier and easier to be able to just allow God to speak to us. He's God. We are not, uh, you know, the Psalm says, you know, it's he that's made us and not we ourselves. Well, well, why does he have to say that? Because he, the psalmist needed reminding, and we need reminding that we, there's a place here, there's an order here, there's a there's a <laughs> there's an authority structure in place, and that is he's God, we are not. Um, but the serpent played to the uh, played to the common uh, desire of of mankind to kind of rise above their position or status in the created order. Uh, this was the original issue with the angels that fell as well, right? Satan uh, desired to, what, be more than just this archangel. He, he, he actually wanted to be like the Most High. Um, so if we go over to, um, let's see, if we go over to 1 John chapter 2, uh, he gives some, John gives some insight here. Uh, let's look up the, the verse, looks like verse 16. So 1 John 2, 16, uh, or let's go to 15. It says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. So if we go back, we see this ori the original temptation. We're in Genesis chapter 3, and then verse 6 says, So when the woman saw the tree was good for food, and it was a delight to the eyes, and that it was a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave, oh, here we go, and, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. I mean, just the way that flows, it seems like he was right there. Like, where is this joker? What is he doing? <laughs> you know, you you are here to protect, to to govern, to have authority. What is your problem, bro? Um, and, and I'll get back to that in a second. But let's look at less of the flesh, less of the eyes, pride of life. That's exactly the three things that it goes through here. It's good for food, right? looked good to her eyes, and boy, oh boy, it's going to make me wise. And not just like, oh, I'm reading a good book, it's going to make me a little wiser or whatever. No, 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 one wise to be like God. That's the problem. And the, and, and the funny thing is, they were as like God as they were ever going to get. That's as like God as mankind is going to be. They were already in the image of God. They weren't going to get any any greater, right? And they were fooled and duped. Uh, into thinking, well, well, Eve was into thinking. Hey, <coughs> we're gonna we're gonna supercharge ourselves. We're gonna level up here. <laughs> you know, we're gonna get the uh, the energy energy ball flowing flying around and 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 you know, move up to level ninety nine. Nope, that's not what happened. That's not what happened at all. But we have this temptation and desire to you know, rise above even where we're supposed to desire. We're not supposed to, we should not want to be in that place. 
But that's a struggle that they obviously had because they were tempted and deceived. Now, it's interesting when we uh, when we look at the parallel in uh, Matthew 4. And I, I mean, I look at this as a parallel. You can look at it differently if you'd like to. But you have Jesus in the wilderness and you have Satan coming to tempt him. So you got the, you know, the first man, Adam, and then, and then the last. Uh, and uh, here, here's Jesus, uh, Matthew 4 and 1 says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Well, yeah, you think? <laughs> and the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So the defense, the shield that Jesus put up was the word of God. And this is, you know, I think this is something that that all Christians really should uh, take note of. When we are tempted, when when things come at us, the, the thing that we use that we can really stand on and depend on is the Word of God. He he used the script. When I say the Word of God in this context, I'm talking about the Scriptures. Uh, the The Word is forever settled in heaven. You know, not one not one jot or tittle is going to pass away until all be all shall come to pass or be fulfilled. Um, you know, the the Word of God is um, is alive and powerful, sharper than any uh, two edged sword. I mean, all these scriptures that we have about the Word of God, it is something that we should use uh, when we are struggling, when we're tempted, when we're uh, coming up against a, a challenge to our faith. Take the Word of God and use that as a, both sort of as a shield and a weapon to be able to uh, guard from those, uh, those temptations uh, just like Jesus did. But look at look look at Satan. He is very clever, right? Verse 5, he says, it says, And then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down. Look at this. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Now, Satan went back to the Psalms, and he literally used Scripture out of context but used the Word of God, pulled a scripture, and threw it at Jesus. So, you know, kind of say, oh, you're a Word guy, huh? You like the Bible? Okay, I'll give you a Bible verse. Just because there's a Bible verse on the screen, just because there's a Bible verse next to something, just because somebody quotes a Bible verse, whether it's a spot-on quote, or most often it's a out-of-context, loosey tra translation of, of, of whatever they're saying. But it doesn't really matter. Even if it's spot-on, dead right with what 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 the bible says right there it's important to be able to look at the totality of scripture and look at scripture in a context that's really just not even in the immediate chapter and verse where where that that scripture might be um because jesus goes and reaches to a different scripture and says uh to him in verse 7 again it is written you shall not put the lord your god to the test so he said, yeah, yeah, that, that's Bible. That's Bible. It's right there, and the Word is good, but the Word also says this. So you need to be able to, as Paul told Timothy, rightly divide the Word. Be able to take Scripture and clarify it with other Scriptures, right? Balance it with the rest of the Scriptures. Otherwise, we could get ourselves into trouble even using the Scriptures, I've seen many people do this. I've seen many many people uh, fall or get wrapped up in false doctrine, and they didn't leave the scriptures. They just used scripture out of context, or only used a certain sampling of scriptures. Like I mentioned at the very beginning, where where people will skip. They'll kind of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, pole vault over Acts, and then jump into Romans. Well, Romans is awesome, but Romans is written to the church in Rome that was already an established church. How did it get established? What birthed the church in Rome? Well, when you go and you read the book of Acts, you see what they did when the churches were birthed. 
Uh, none of the epistles, Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, or Galatians, <laughs> I already said Galatians, Galatians, uh, the church at, at Philippi, Colossae, right, the letters written to, uh, uh, to Timothy or Titus, those written by John and Peter, right, James, not one of these epistles, Revelation, nothing, nothing there, Hebrews, right, just, just, Every single one of them, from Romans to Revelation, not one of them is written to a group of unbelievers in a letter to try and explain to them how to be saved, how to come into the kingdom of God, right? No, none, and none of them really show like the operation of the church, the day-to-day -day activities, what they kind of did and how they flowed and that kind of thing. None of them. What they are is for already established churches, people who already believe, they are already uh, what we quote-unquote Christians, they are already saved. This is, uh, you know, these, here's some important doctrines, here's how you deal with certain situations, here's how you think about uh, different, different matters within the church. That's what those are. And so the only, the only place, the only picture we have of the church doing its thing and of unbelievers going from unbelievers to believers, going from unsaved to saved, going from non-church to church, the only place we have that is in the book of Acts. And so when people are deficient in their understanding of the book of Acts, they are deficient in their understanding of what it is to be the church, of what it is to be in the kingdom of God. And so that's a, that's a perfect example of right here. We need to have the totality of Scripture, the full witness of Scripture, and be able to rightly divide it. So then, of course, Satan goes on, and he said to him, all these, uh, oh, whoops, sorry. Again, the devil took him, this is verse 8, Matthew 4. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall Worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. So a, a good parallel to what happened in the garden. Unfortunately, Adam and Eve did not use this defense mechanism. They had, I guess, the Word of God. They didn't have the Bible, the Scriptures, but they had the Word of God. Don't eat of the fruit. They added to that Word of God. They twisted the Scriptures. They had un, um, unscriptural thinking going on, doctrine that was incorrect. And they said, hey, we were not even allowed to touch it. But as soon as they touched that fruit, guess what happened? Nothing, right? And then they ate it and disobeyed the Word of God. They should have said, get out of here, Satan. No, we are already in the image of God. We are servants of God and, you know, ambassadors or the, the uh, government of God in the earth, and, and that's, that's our place, and we don't want to get out of our place, you know, like you did, <laughs> Satan. Um, but alas, that's not what happened. Uh, what happened is she took, ate the fruit, gave to her husband, who was there, and... Uh, then, um, yeah, it was all downhill from, from there. So, uh, verse 7 says, then this is, uh, we'll go back to Genesis 3. Verse 7 says, Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees, of the garden. So again, they they hid them. They're used to just being in the presence of God. They're used to uh, God coming and and they just be in fellowship. And now God comes and they're what? They're hiding. They're disconnected. The relationship is broken. There's disobedience. There's shame. There's sin. And this is ultimately what sin does, right? Sin is simple to define disobedience to God. That's what sin is. 
just disobedience to God. If you if you disobey God, you have sinned. Uh, before there was a Mosaic law, before you know there were there were uh, uh, tablets of stone. We have God saying, "Don't eat of this particular tree." They did that, and that was sin. So it's very easy to see disobeying God equals sin. What did sin do? Sin separated them from God. That relationship, now they're hiding from God, whereas before they would have been eagerly you know, anticipating, awaiting his arrival. And uh, here we are with them hiding from God. They were ashamed. Uh, yay, now they've got more wisdom, but didn't do them any good. Uh, they certainly weren't as gods. And they made a grave mistake, obviously. Now, I think it's uh, I think it's important to to note that in this scenario, if we go to First Timothy chapter two, it gives a little clarification here. Um, First Timothy chapter two and verse twelve says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. Why? Well, you're obviously, you know, Paul's obviously just a, a woman hater. He's, you know, misogynist. He's, you know, this terrible guy. No. Verse 13, he, he clarifies. He says, for Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived. But the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. So we see that God created, again, as, as we read last time in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I think I started in like 14. I was like, no, it's 13. No, it's 12. No, it's 11. <laughs> Got right there this time. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Now I commend you because... You remember me and everything and maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of, of, of the wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. So again, God, Christ, man, woman is that created order. And this is something I'm going to get into next time, both in just the created order, talking a little bit about that and the need for strong, uh, strong men who hear from God, know the word of the Lord, and are able to stand and implement that in their homes, right? For themselves and in their homes. Because if, if Adam had done that there with Eve, we'd all be in the garden right now. <laughs> so, man, man, kind of wish he would have uh, he would have stepped up, said something. But... Uh, I just want to leave it with this, right? God has a created order, God, Christ, man, woman. Uh, we are not supposed to, now in that context in Timothy, it's, he he's not wanting the women to have authority over the men that they're not supposed to have. In the context of the Garden of Eden, it's the same thing. We are We do not have authority over God or even lateral to God and that was the temptation. Oh, well, you're going to be like God. Like God's not going to have anything on you if you'll just disobey him and eat this fruit. And that's not true. We need to respect and align ourselves with God's authority and God's responsibility structure. Right? That's what happened with Adam. Right? He he had the authority, but he didn't take that authority and therefore he's responsible for what went on and the problems. So we'll get into that next time, but I want to leave it there with this. We need to obey God. We need to obey his word. When we are reading scripture, when we're hearing scripture taught, when, when, when maybe when things come at us that we didn't know before, or and we think we should know this, uh, or it's uh, something we haven't heard before, or this is the first time we're unfamiliar with it, what we should do is we should go and we should study it out in the word of God, we should read the scriptures, study the scriptures, pray on it, study the scriptures some more, and we should try to understand what has God said on this thing, and then we obey 
what was actually said. Because if we don't obey the word, then it doesn't really uh, do us much good. If we go to the book of James, we see uh, this is the book of James chapter 1 and uh, around verse 22 or so. Let's go take a look. Yes. Uh, James 1, 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he looks like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So <clears throat> we are supposed to be doers of the word who act upon the word. Acting how? In obedience to it. That's what I want to leave us with. We need to obey the word of God. We would all be in the Garden of Eden in bliss right now if Adam and Eve had simply heard the word of God and obeyed it. And that is what we need. We can all poo-poo on them. Oh, if I was there. Really, I wonder, because are we right now obeying what we know to obey, doing what we know to do? So that that's kind of where we need to evaluate ourselves and go, wait a minute. I can I can look at them and say they shouldn't have done that, but what about myself? Am I obeying the word? And am I subjecting myself to the word? When things come my way, am I using the scriptures as my benchmark, my 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 right, my baseline, like Jesus did? Or am I coming up with some clever philosophy like Adam and Eve may have been trying to do? Instead, let's use the scriptures as our defensive mechanism. Let's use the scriptures as our weapon to be able to uh, destroy and break down the, the works of the enemy. And above all else, again, be doers of the word. So I hope this has helped you guys. We're right here in Genesis chapter 3. Uh, we will pick it back up next time with a continued discussion of uh, this whole scenario and probably finish uh, chapter 3 next time. But until then, keep it locked and loaded right here. Love you guys. God bless you. And we will catch you on the next episode.